today the chapter 4 the making of global world when we talk about the word globalization or when we talk about the making of the world around we always think that globalization is connected with economic systems globalization is the growth of the financial system in the past 50 years but in this unit we are going to study the various factors which are being present along with the change of the economic system in the modern era so before the modern period pre-modern period what are the major contributors for the development of modernization and in this chapter especially we focus deliberately and precisely on the history of trade how did the trade has contributed its efforts to make the world to become a global village then we think about the history of migration when did the actual migration start or what was the major purpose or the reasons which forced the people to get migrated then we shall discuss about the search of work what made the people to search about work what are the factors that contributed the people to lose their work and brought them down to a condition where they have to search work and later on we move on to the movement of the capital how did the history tell us the initial stages of moving of the capital and what are the factors that motivated the business people the trade people to do large trades and how are they well connected with each other how they used to carry the huge amounts from one region to other region how they started the trade initially how it got expanded later how the well connectedness and change of technology has brought very sufficient necessary equipment for the people to do large trade and we also try to stress on the global interconnectedness how did the world become globally interconnected towards it so all these factors are also focusing for globalization other than this we also have certain other factors from the age old times or from the ancient times in the ancient times we have the people like travelers traders priests and the pilgrims who traveled from one corner of the world to the other corner for example we have megasthenes traveling from china persia across and coming to india who studied about the indian conditions and he went on to the indonesian lands so like that we have travelers who have traveled across the continents so as the travelers in the ancient period they were the sources of knowledge actually because they traveled from one continent to the other continent or it would be rather right to say that from one kingdom to another kingdom when the kingdoms they have passed across and they have collected the evidences and they have recorded the evidences in their books that have played a vital role so along with their journey they also brought for us the social information about the kingdoms which is not known for many of the people in the present day those were being the sources for us to learn about the history and we also have priests and pilgrims contributing a large for the historical combinations and interconnections between one kingdom to the other kingdom are established because of the large people moving from one kingdom to another kingdom either by the host of the priests or to go on a pilgrimage and the vast distances brought us lot of knowledge in the fields of money values then the skills the ideas how was the money used in a particular kingdom how it is used in our kingdom so we can compare it when we have the knowledge of the other kingdoms currencies and all these things when it comes to the values for example let us take india and saudi arabia india is a secular state saudi arabia is run by islamic law so we can compare what are the values that are valid there what are the values that are not valid here what are the values that are valid here and what are not practiced there so this compared to study also can be done when you have the thorough knowledge of two different kingdoms in the same way we have the different skills people of persia people of the roman people are having well sculptured people greco buddhist art the people have traveled from greece to india to establish the greco buddhist art because there were people who brought the information for us so skill also got passed from one region to another region we have the great buddha statues which are just like the greco greek 
sculptures which we have during that time and then we have the ideas the earlier ideas the present ideas the construction of the new models the islamic architecture all these things are the transformation of the ideas from that kingdom to this kingdom and we also have inventions the modern technology getting inventions so leaving aside all the positive aspects we also have some negative implications because of the passage of people from one area to the other area or one kingdom to the other kingdom that is the germs yes you heard the word right germs not germs germs the disease causing insects or animals initially in india we don't have any diseases or in china we don't have much diseases but the people those who got migrated from europe towards the east were having certain diseases later on that spread to the diseases or people in india or in the other countries which was also spreading the dead dreadful diseases like plague smallpox all these diseases are also the adding advantages when the people got transformed from one region to another region so when we study about the transformation or the globalization we just generally stress only on financial matters only on the growth of the economies but we most of the times neglect the important contributors of history those people are the trade the migration the search of work factors the moment of the capital global interconnectedness which is existing from the ancient times to the modern times and we also have the ancient times travelers trade priests and pilgrims vast distances traveled by those people has not only fetches knowledge money values skills and ideas but also the germs diseases which we were not aware of any such kind till that moment and by 13th century this has become an unmistakable link where you can have a good connectivity between the west to the modern east or between the modern west to the present existing east so this has established a fantastic linkage from the western part of the world to the modern eastern part of the world where we have good transformation of the ideas it may be in the form of values knowledge ideas germs diseases whatever it may be but the link has established certain relations between the people it may be a trade link it may be a migration link it may be the people of search of work or intended labor whatever it is but it has brought a new outlook of global interconnectedness and the globalization so that we are going to discuss in detail step by step in this unit silk routes the silk routes link the world how did the silk routes got established and how did the process of the routes have connected one corner of the world to the other corners as in the introduction of the lesson we have discussed that it's not only the trade it's not only the migration concept that have brought together everything or it's not only the financial matters that have brought the global interconnectedness it is a route network which has also connected the people from europe to asia so let us try to find out what are the different products that brought the people together let us see here the west bound china so in the western part of china we have the boundary where china used to sell or send her silk cargoes means the silk carrying large ships along this route that's the reason why it is famous all across the world that it is a silk route link to the world from china it started to move to all corners of europe so initially as it is the most significant factor that silk is being exported from this region to other corners via through this route that is the reason why it has been clearly specified as it is a silk route but it's not mentioned that only silk is been carried through this route if you study in detail if you go into the details of this one we can understand that there are several silk routes identified by the historians either by land or by sea so it can be either by waterways or by landways so it's not only that only through waterways the people have transported the silk and silk has been the major positive end to export from the asian countries 
but not only silk there are other products which are connecting the vast asia europe and northern africa is the silk trade but the silk trade can also be called as pottery trade textile trade spices trade and in return from europe we got gold silver all the precious metals getting flowing back so when from this side when we are exporting the silk when we are exporting the textiles when we are exporting the spices from india and southeast asia we also got in return from the europe the gold the silver the diamonds and all these things so this all has been an interconnected trade relations so we may get it out from which century do we actually have this trade relations the exact date cannot be found out by the historians till now because the connectedness has been traced from asia to europe and via through north africa is from christian era before it means prior to the christian era before the christian era has been discussed before the good olden days we have the connectivity till the 15th century bc we have the existence of trade relations between the different corners of asia europe and northern africa and we already just now learned that it's not only the silk that has been exported through this route or it's not only the sea route that has been used by the people they used to use land route wherever there is possibility and when there is no possibility of using land route they used to shift to the sea route and the other products what they used to export are the pottery the pots the beautiful pots which are well engraved on their pot the colors the pictures everything which was sent to greece and babylon and we also have spices and the textiles from india and southeast asia also and we also have not only the trade relations only regarding this parts from this side but from the other side also we have the trade relations established because in return when these people used to take these products to there there they are being paid back with gold and silver and all the precious metals towards the east from west we used to get the valuable metals towards the east and it's not only the metals it's not only the trade the link has been established the same route has been used by the christian missionaries to come towards asia in order to spread the religion which was actually used by the muslim preachers before when they came first and it's not only the christianity or the islam community people but buddhism has been spread from india to other corners of asia via through this route only so the silk route is not just the route which has been used only for silk trade it is famous because the silk cargoes are been sent through this route via this route but it's not only the silk it is textiles it is spices it is pottery that has been traded from this part and from the other part we used to get the most precious metals like gold and silver and other metals which are been inter exchange and there was a good significant flow and this relation of trade relations were not only confined to sea routes but they are also connected with land routes wherever there is a possibility there and not the sea routes and looking at the situations when was this actual links established it is traced that these actual links are been established prior to the christian era to the modern 15th century bce so it is that link has been a very old link between the asia this europe and the northern part of africa and it's not only used to have trade relations it was also used to for spread of the religion first the buddhism which has gone from india to other corners of asia today in india the number of people who follow buddhism may be very less but the motherland for buddhism is india and today it has been spread to all countries of asia and in the same way the islam community and the christianity first the islam preachers have come from europe or the western part of asia via through the silk route to india to china and they have spread their religion in the other corners of asia and in the same way the christian people from europe who initially came missionaries to spread the word of god were also have started their journey 
from via through the silk route only so this is a significant factor which we need to remember that the silk route is a name of a route because most of the cargo ships which carry silk have to used or were being used this route but it's not only the silk we have pottery we have other precious metals getting in flow via this side and that side and it's not only for trade it is for the spread of the word of the god the religious prosperity the spreading of buddhism islam and christianity were also connected with this silk route the foot travels as we have discussed till now the silk route not only trade the food habits what we have today also are being crossing from one continent to the other continent it would be very astonishing for us to know some of the foods which we call it with different names are being traditionally branded with the country's name but actually they do not belong to that particular country let us see here example pasta pasta is a name which we generally get associated with italy but actually pasta has been initially been used or carried away to italy by the arab traders when in the wage olden days so in the ancient period we have arabs using pasta arab traders took this one to sicily which is a modern day part of italy so pasta has been associated with italy and then noodles which we all know noodles here in india and in china from china it went to the west and it has become spaghetti so now we feel that western people have introduced for us noodles western people are introducing for us pasta so like that we have different habits what we feel like generally they are from the west but actually they have traveled from some other place to there and where the, from there they got branded to themselves in the same way with various other similar food habits in india and in japan we have the common food habits because people have migrated there the travelers have passed from one area to another areas where these people have carried certain knowledge certain crops certain fruits and they have passed it on to another regions in the same way let us now find out the actual what happened see here the food traveling example they used to go for long distances cultural exchange so because of the long distances trade or traveling by the priests by the people those who want to do scholars studies pilgrimages all these people crossed various kingdoms while they were crossing various kingdoms what they have felt it's a spectacular thing that has made them to come towards this ideology that has brought them the idea of understanding all these things that has given the boom for the people to have idea about this one that has made the people to transform that knowledge to this said either by writing in the books or by carrying the fruits or by taking that particular crop to some other region so the passage of the information has been done so it shows for us that in the pre modern days also we have the interconnected means between one region to the other region by different other sources it may be by silk trade it may be by food trade or it may be by the people moving from one region to another region the pilgrimages or the priests now as we move on they have traveled for very long distances so that made them to carry certain foods with them and these travelers and traders have brought the new crops from one region to another region that has brought the knowledge for them and not only the new crops the ready food stuff because we all know when we are traveling we would like to carry certain amount of home food along with us suppose you are traveling for a long journeys we prefer to have the tamarind rice or the chapatis which are you feel comfortable with that that you would like to have with you in the same way the ready food stuff was also carried from one region to another region the example of arabs carrying pasta is also one of such kind of example and the common foods which are found in almost all the regions are the potatoes the soya the groundnut the maize the tomatoes chilies sweet potatoes and so on these all are being carried away because of the people getting migrated from one region to another region even in america the continent which was been discovered by christopher columbus 
where it was initially been inhabited by the american indians so the food what they used to consume has become the basic food in america because the basic people are american indians so in this way the food have passed from one place to another places the commonalities of food was also found at various corners of the world because the common people living at different different corners and we also find the life and death question because of food generally you may get it out how can a food be a life and death matter for people yes life and death has been a part of the food items because poor people in ireland started to eat better when they initially got the crop of potatoes potatoes according to them were at very less cost available at very cheap cost because they used to have meat which is being exported from austria australia to these places so when australia people have to export it to these people as it is a perishable good it has become very difficult and very costly for them where a common people cannot afford for that so with the invention of the refrigerated boats and ships then only the possibility of carrying meat has become an easy task but by the discovery of that one the cost of sending it has become costly again where a common people cannot reach to that extent so potatoes has been surfacing the scarcity of the food during that period so the potatoes ireland people are well connected with the potatoes and they were happily having the food bread with potatoes but as the time passed on there was a time when the potato crop has been affected with a dreadful disease so the entire crop got destroyed and by 1840s the people those who are habituated of having potatoes and lack of money to buy the meat there is no food available for them many thousands of people lost their lives out of starvation this has forced them to come to that kind of situations these all are the serious effects which have affected them on a very larger scale so life and death are also well connected with food food sometimes gives life for people when they are hungry but if the same food is not available for us that leads to star- starvation where thousands and hundreds of thousands of people have died out of starvation these all have added extra efforts for them so we need to remember all these facts yes they are painful facts but we need to remember all these facts so food travel food also traveled from one region to another region so it is not the food that has been traveled it is the people those who traveled from one region to another region have carried the food along with them and introduced the food for them and made the habit of people to have that food in that particular region though it is new but it, they have adopted that one to their culture and made a part and parcel of their culture the example we have pasta which was taken by the arab traders to the italian countries today in italy the most famous one is pasta in the same way when we talk about noodles generally we get to a assumption that noodles are introduced by the west but in actual terms noodles went to west from china means from the east so like this there are many foods which have traveled from east to west so it is also reveals for us that there is a good connectivity global interconnectedness prior to the modern era in the pre modern era also that's the key point which we need to remember here let us now focus on the conquest diseases and trade we already have focused light on what that have connected the people from the ancient period to the modern period yes the branding may be changed as globalization but global interconnectedness was present pre in the pre modern period also now as we also discussed about the food stuff and everything how it got transformed into the various stages how the names have changed but the same common food is found at various corners of the world now moving on to the other important aspect is that conquest how did the world became the issue or a race for conquering the other countries or how did the colonialism has been widespread so far that's the basic point which we are going to discuss in this segment so the world shrank greatly after the 
discovery of sea route to Asia has been found. In 1493, after Vasco de Gama discovered the first sea route to India that have opened the doors for the people of Europeans to step towards Africa and Asia. Because till that time, they were traveling through the land route. Yes, the route existed during that time also. But when the land route has been blocked by the Ottoman Empire people, Turkey, Constantinople, later they need to find out some alternative to get connected with the East. As we discussed that, the discovery of sea route to India has enabled India or Asia to get well connected with the European countries. And all the European countries are in great need of colonies. This is what something which made them to get attracted towards Asia and Africa. While Vasco de Gama was connecting India via through the sea route, he made a route which is connecting through Cape of Good Hope, the last tip of Africa and then to India. So when he came through that way, it made it very clear for all the others that we can connect Africa and India with Europe. Till now they are connected only with the northern part of Africa. That too because of the great existence of Sahara Desert for 10.5 million square kilometers which restricted the entry of people towards the south of Africa. So now the Europeans got an edge over that to move on to south of Africa via through the very easiest way through Atlantic Ocean and then coming into Indian Ocean and entering into India. So Asia and Africa got well connected with the first discovery of sea route. That is the reason why it is rightly remarked that world shrank greatly. The entire movement got completely changed with the discovery of sea route to India or Asia in particular. Then when we took on to the other issues like Indian Ocean has been always very busy with the trade like goods, people, knowledge and customs. As the time passed on, now the trade has going to be very large. Initially, the trade was only between North of Africa and some countries of Asia. But now, it is going to be well connected with all the countries in Asia and South Africa or Southern part of Africa and Southern part of Asia as well. So, not only this, America was newly discovered which is also add an advantage because when the America was discovered by Christopher Columbus, when Christopher Columbus discovered about America, America discovery has given a wide range of scope because we got the abundant land, the new varieties of crops, the minerals, which gave a scope for large number of countries to come and occupy them. And as the availability of land is more, the number of people are very less. Most of the people who are living in America are the people those who have got migrated from European countries or they were picked up as slaves from Africa. So that has given a trade and lives for the people in America. The other major interesting point what we have is America not only really had this and today America we call as United States of America. But Christopher Columbus discovered America which is a very large continent comprising of North American continent. So according to him, America means Canada, USA, Mexico and countries like Peru, all the Caribbean islands together he called it as America. So the minerals, the metals which are available in Peru and Mexico were also gathered by the European countries and they actually worked as an input for the countries to occupy the countries in Asia. So European countries need funds. The funds are being supported by the minerals and metals which are available in America, especially in the countries like Peru and Mexico. So these countries started to make the European countries to become rich, wealthy. Then automatically they started to buy the latest equipped weapons, boats, army and start to attack the other colonial countries in Asia and Africa. So their kingdom of colonial empire started to flourish and become larger and larger because of the support what they are getting from Peru and Mexico lands. And America has been a source for the slaves. They started need slaves because they need to do agriculture. There the basic European people do not have much stamina to work hard because they do not get much exposed to sunlight. When it comes to Africans, 
Africans basically are thick skinned people because they experience heavy amount of sun, sun rays. Their skin is completely dark toned and even their hair gets curled up because of the extreme heat what they do. So that nature of the Africans makes them to do lot of hard work that inherits the capacity for them to do lot of hard work which is required for the Americans to do in their crops and fields. That is the basic reason why Americans are very much interested to have slaves from African countries. Then moving on to the other point what we have the legends of South America especially those who have heard about the fabulous city the city of enormous wealth that is none other than the city in South America that is El Dorado. El Dorado has been fabled of city of gold. So people started to move in search of gold to that particular city to identify the city and to uh, do the mining to acquire gold from there. That's how people started to move towards South America also. So North America and South America are being occupied by people. And then we have the Spanish conquerors who are very clever and extraordinary people. Why did I use the words like very clever and extraordinary people? Because Spanish people are able to control Brazil for more than 100 years. And it's very easy for them actually because they never used to fight with guns or weapons. Why not guns and weapons? Because if you carry guns that can be identified by the people, local people, they may understand that you are coming into their kingdom to occupy the kingdom. But the Spanish people used to carry not the weapons but the germs with them. Yes, what you heard is right. The germs, the diseases. So Spanish people used to carry the germs like smallpox. And smallpox has been a deadly killer. There is no medicine for smallpox. So the long installation and lack of immunity. The basic people of Americans are the people those who got migrated from Europe as I told you just now. So these people do not get exposed to much to sunlight. So they do not have much of the immunity power. So when it comes to the Spanish people introducing the disease of smallpox because of the lack of immunity, these people are becoming weak and killing themselves or they are being killed because of the dreadful disease. Because of this dreadful disease, the most capable people are being killed or banished away from the place. Obviously, it becomes very easy for the conqueror to co occupy that place. That's what it rightly mentioned by the writer John Withrow who mentioned that blessings for the colonist. Smallpox has been a blessing for the colonist by the God by clearing the lands and making it possible for them to occupy the lands. These all possibilities made the Spanish people to expand their colonial kingdom to various corners of the world. This is how they used to do the biological warfare. Even today, we are scared to listen the word like biological warfare, where people do not fight or countries do not fight with military, with arms, with nuclear weapons, but they just simply introduced a chemical or a germ into the community, which later on get passes through the other people and later on it becomes a deadly disease in the country, which automatically ruins the economy, which automatically ruins the people's living standard there. That's what the Spanish people have done way back and they have targeted the colonies and they were very successful in achieving their targets. This is a very difficult point to accept but it is a fact which we need to understand that. And as we move on, other than that, the countries like China and India are considered to be the richest countries during that period up to 18th century. So that the fundamental point which made the European countries to find out the sea routes to India, to find out all other possibilities to reach to India and Asia because China and India are the filthy rich countries till that time. And China has been restricting the overseas trade, doing very limited trade, which also made the possibility of lack of income for the people in the West. So they need the other possible opportunities for them to get involved in that and to fight and get their freedom of trade. So once we get trade, we can flourish. This is the underlying concept between them. And to explore the richness to web gold, metals and all these things from India and in China that made the other countries to fall on 
a fray towards India or towards Asia. So let us look at some of the key points which are in Europe. If you take guns and move on, it is very easy for the enemies to identify it and they would like to destroy it. But if a disease is taken with some people who are diseased, we cannot identify what is the actual problem. And by the time you identify that one, the entire country would be in trouble, which automatically cleans off the most capable person and makes it easy for the conquerors to occupy the lands. The next most interesting fact in Europe is that poverty and hunger are in Europe till the later part of the 19th century. And not only this, they also have the deadly diseases widespread and religious conflicts. So 18th century has also brought the new concept of slaves from Africa. As I told you before, we need a strong people who can do hard work and withstand with the hot sun which is not possible for the Europeans nor for the Americans because Europeans are the people those who got migrated to America also. So it's not possible for neither for the Europeans nor for the Americans to do a lot of hard work by withstanding in the hot sun and working in the large fields. So the best possible alternative for them is to explore the slaves, bring the African thick skinned people who can do a lot of hard work even in the withstanding hot sun. So get them brand them as slaves and force them to work for a long period and earn huge and huge profits. This is the possible alternative what the Europeans and the Americans thought during that time. And by 18th and 19th centuries, they were able to capture many of the slaves from Africa and put them into the agricultural field works and started to produce cotton and sugar in very large scale market. So that's how the changes have been occurred and the conquests, the diseases and the trades. This is a brief recap. Let's have a brief look at the points now. World has been shook off when the new discovery of sea route, the news has spread to the entire Europeans. They always tried to explore the countries in Asia and Africa as soon as possible. The reason for that, as I told you before, China and India are branded as the richest countries till the 18th century. So possible to get all the wealth and explore all of them and occupy the countries and try to squeeze their wealth. The possibilities of the Europeans were always to gather the wealth. And next, Indian Ocean has been always bustling with the trades of goods, people, knowledge and customs. As the time passed on, with the discovery of America, abundant land and crop minerals, which made the people to explore towards America, and at the same time, possibility of the trade of the people, for making them to move towards America, picking up the people from Africa and sending them to America. And the precious metals which are available in Peru and Mexico, which financed the countries of Europe during that time, because they need huge investments in order to go for a long voyage towards the East. That fund has been raised from the precious stones and metals, which they were able to collect from Peru and Mexico. That's how the European countries got much benefited from the new discovered land, America. And then the legends were in the race to find out the most fabulous city of gold that is El Dorado in South America, which also made the possibility of exploring South America and later on occupying South American countries. So that's how the colonial system expanded to a very larger scale. And the concept of diseases enters here. Spanish kings or the conquerors, instead of carrying guns, metals, weapons and everything, they used to carry the diseased people who are filled with germs and they introduced the smallpox disease to the place where they need to occupy that one. And this has been a very dreadly disease and the people not having any proper idea how to save themselves from the smallpox and there is anyway no possible medicine available to them at that time. So thousands of people used to disappear because of this dreadly disease. Automatically the land would be cleared. It becomes very easy for the conquerors to occupy that particular land. Target will be fulfilled. That is the reason why John Withrup has rightly explained that smallpox has been the blessings for the colonists and it's a path of the way which has been given by the God himself by clearing the places 
and making the people to be the number in less and the next why did the people move towards india and china because in europe we have poverty and hunger in order to solve these problems they need to find out and acquire more wealth and they are already struggling with deadly diseases and with religious conflicts so they need to find out some countries which are filthy rich to solve their economic crisis or problems or poverty and hunger that's how they have searched for countries like africa india and china which already gave an alternative for them to do hard work in america by the people of africa africa known as slaves so that's the momentum which have generated the slave trade during that time automatically the metal trade mineral trade gold trade and other products trade by occupying them colonies conquest spread of the diseases to various corners of the world all these things are being interlinked with the main concept of trade and by the end of the 18th century cotton and sugar are being produced for the european markets by the african slaves by the european countries that's what have been a fabulous change of trade from the initial stages to the modernness now understanding like the most dangerous side of colonization the colonial systems that is the cattle plague the gift given by the british colonial masters to their countries which they occupied especially to the african countries is the plague the cattle plague let us now learn about africa first of all why the people in africa do not show much interest to work to wages see africa is basically a very large continent and the population living in africa is relatively very less so as a time passed on people started to have large lands with less number of owners and large cattle also so they used to have huge amount of cattle with them and lands with them so automatically even if you are in a africa why would you like to work when you have land as well as a cattle to what you have necessary for you so as the situations change the britishers came to africa in their process of colonization when they started to make the colonies they started to occupy some of the countries in africa where they find it really very difficult to find a person who works for labor as i told you just now the backdrop of africans though they look dark skinned but they have large lands under their names and large livelihood for them so whatever they need they can get whatever they want they can cultivate so there is no chance or there is no necessity for them to do lot of hard work or work for wages under somebody else so this made the britishers to think again as the time passed the situations changed the europeans are attracted towards africa to they want to colonize africa because they got some information that here in africa we have large amount of land available and minerals available especially gold and some costly stones like diamonds so they want something else in larger scale so they came to africa to explore africa because most of the people don't know how to step into africa so finally they have sent explorers they have sent missions to come to africa and finally they were on their path to reach the final destination after they reached the final path now they find the practical problem is that africans none of them are ready or interested to work the problem is they don't like to work because they already have everything whatever they need so now how did the britishers force the people to work so this is the other side of colonization especially when it regards to africa as the time passed on the employers used many methods they used to lend some money for them they used to give at very high rate of interest they used to force them they used to make it mandatory for the people to work in order to have certain rights so like that initially they brought some people into the work and after they brought them into the work they made it mandatory and they say confined only to that particular work area 24 hours they have to stay there only they should not leave that area without the permission and the permissions are not given at all once in a while in a year they may give the permission ask them to leave outside because 
the Britishers are afraid that these people may leave away the place and go back and it is very difficult for them to get the replacement of the work. So like this the situations have changed and the constitution or according to their rules they used to follow. Literally they want people to work at very less wages or no wages. That is the only law, only constitution what they know. They don't want any other benefits to be done to the countries which they are occupying. So the mine workers are especially brought under the mines and a compound wall was built and in this compound wall only they have to work for a large time or almost the entire day they have to stay there only and they were not at all allowed to move freely. By 1880s as I told you the name of the lesson that is the topic that is the cattle plague or the render pest this has come to Africa in 1890s then how did it come to Africa? As I told you the backdrop of Africa, the people are capable of holding lands and had large amount of lively stock with them. So in order to feed the British soldiers, the Italians who are staying in Eritrea that is in the southeastern part of Africa, those people need some food. So as I told you before, the Europeans are have having the habit of having meat with them. So lot of stock of live animals has been sent to the people of Italian soldiers under the British rule in Eritrea. So in order to provide food for the soldiers in the Eritrea region, the ship has flown all along the cross of Africa and reached the region after five years. So while it reached after five years, 90% of the animals which are in the boat or the ship were dead. So these 90% of the animals dead bodies were in the same boat where it has given rise for the plague. So that's how the plague has entered into the people of Africa through the Britishers. That's the gift given by the colonial masters to them. So this is the process how plague has stepped into Africa. So 19th century has played a very vital role in the world economy. So the economists started to study to dig the facts to understand what factors have changed the outlook of the world economy. So if you look at the 19th century actually we term 19th century from the 1801 to 19th century but here the 19th century has been turned from 1815 to 1914. So this term has been considered as a crucial 19th century period. So during this term, the shape or the economy has got not only the financial status of the countries has got changed, but also in the various forms like the economics, the entire economy has been got reshaped. Then the political changes have occurred whole across the globe, the social the society has witnessed certain changes. The culture has got transformed, mixed and the metropolitan, cosmopolitan culture has got established. Then technology. Technology started to influence the people in a very larger scale. This is how the 19th century has been changing the entire shape of the society. The society got remoduled into its framework. It has been changing its original form and getting into a new form like how amoeba changes its shape. The society has got complete transformation from this. If you study in the point of view of economics, the economy, the transformation of the societies has been a crucial step of the 19th century. As it is described by many of the economists that flow has been increased rapidly during the 19th century. What has been flowing? What was the flow? How did the flow start? What is the flow that is being termed by the economists? What flow are they referring to? The referring of the flow is in regards to three main aspects. One is international economic exchanges. Money started to flow. Economies started to get exchanged from one country to another country. The second major factor is labor the people in search of jobs started to migrate from one place 
to another place not in a walkable distance they started to move from one corner of the world to the other corners of the world they started to cross the oceans and seas with a hope that they can survive somewhere leaving their own homelands so that has given birth to the concept of immigration so the immigration has come into existence then after the concept of immigration has come into existence then we have the capital now talking truly about the money as we started to discuss about the capital capital means truly about the finance money the money investments were earlier restricted themselves only to the short term money loans but later on this have got transformed into long term loans and these long term loans have always focused not only within their own countries but they have moved abroad to very larger regions so as the time passed on the capital investments were also started to move on from one continent to other continents far off places so the 19th century has brought a complete change in the outlook of the society that is the reason why it is rightly termed as the society has been got transformed reshaping of the existing relations has been occurred so that is why the 19th century has not only really changed the economic status of few countries in europe but they were also able to influence many of the countries in asia in africa in america and also in latin american countries so the 19th century base or the key factor was a change the change in economic political social cultural and the technological aspects which has got the society into complete transformation and this can be judged in three bullet points like flow of international economic exchanges it can be dollar moving from one corner to another corner it can be rubles it can be pounds so it started to move on from one corner to another corner so the exchange started to move rapidly and then the labor in search of job the hope that we can do some work and we can survive somewhere which is do far away from our own motherland living and sacrificing their own mother own countries and moving on to the new countries and doing lot of hard work there and trying to earn something some bread to survive that has given to the rise of the concept of immigration and later on we have the main key focus that is capital the capital investments from short term loans to long term loans also played a very vital role so this is the brief introduction of the 19th century what are the major changes that were brought in this century in respect to the uk people so as the time passed on by the 19th century the world economy started to take its shape the world economy how did it get into its shape that is the main factor here as the goods started to changing in the food production for example if you take in great britain till that time the people were started to consume only the bread but as the situation started to change they started to have corn as one of the staple food for them when they initially started to have corn they had availability of corn and as corn is not taken by everybody so regularly so it was very easy for them to manage and get the corn to the required population as a cost and availability is less the corn became a major food for all the people and this made the import of corn to be restricted by the government officials by making corn laws so when the corn laws were imposed the self sufficiency of the great britain to provide food for all its citizens lost its capability to provide food or feed back for them so as there are laws which are restricting the import of corn the corn items so now it is a very difficult task for them to supply corn for the other people and it became costly for them 
so the food started to become costly in britain so the industrialists the businessmen people forced the government to scrap away the corn laws and avail the availability of importing corn from the far off nations so when these corn laws were being scrapped off then the people started to get more availability of corn from other corners of the world especially from the eastern part of asia and europe the lands in the eastern europe russia australia are been cleared completely in order to fulfill the needs of the britain people so the production of the corn has become a major crop in eastern europe in russia and in australia so as the time passed on the production of corn has increased in a very large scale and the availability of corn has become at very less cost for the britain people with this the britishers decided not to cultivate corn at all in the homeland it's very cheap and less cost when it is imported from the other countries so when they decided to import it from the other countries then thousands of men and women who were actually working in the agricultural fields were thrown out of the work they were forced to leave the work because there is no situation for them to work further because there is no production going on and one more factor which added for the increase of imports to great britain was the increase in the trade the industrial revolution has expanded the boundaries of trade for the companies of great britain which made them to become richer and richer as a market has become a global market for them so because of the availability of the global market tendency for them the company owners the industrialist people started to become richer and richer this also added or created a boom to have more number of imports from the other countries so like this the production of local crop has been failed it been stopped the britain later lost the capability or self sufficiency to feed its nationalist people then it was forced to scrap away the corn laws which were actually restricting the import of corn from the other countries and later on they have scrapped away the corn laws and started to import the corn from the eastern europe russia and the australian countries so when this demand for the corn has been increased in great britain the countries like eastern european countries russia and australia cleared their lands and cultivated corn which is at very less costly brought available for the britishers so britishers started to import corn at very less cost when it is compared to the production when it is being made at their homelands this resulted in the loss of job for the thousands of men and women in the great britain so this situation has turned really a very drastic change in the world economy why we have to consider this one as a drastic change means till that time many people used to travel from east to west having a scope of better future towards the west but once this tendency has started now many people started to migrate from britain to fulfill the needs of the australian fields or the american fields where there is a shortage of labor the supply of labor these people try to move to the other places in order to fulfill the needs in order to get the betterment opportunities for them in order to have something to eat rather than dying there with hunger or starvation these all factors so the rinder spread or the cattle plague as we were discussing about the cattle plague let us now first find out how was the situation there before the arrival of the cattle plague plague was a very dangerous disease which changed many of the people's life 
these people were actually filthy rich. It means that there is no necessity for them to work. But the situations turned them to become as daily wage labor. Let us now go into the details. In Africa, around some 1890s, the Britishers occupied many places in Africa. With the discovery of sea route to Africa through via the Cape of Good Hope, they all were able to get the clarity on the countries which are located in the African continent. Slowly, with their armies, they were able and capable to establish the rule over that regions. Once they were able to establish the rules over that regions, then they understand that the people here are less in number, but they have thousands of cattle along with them. Population is less, cattle is more. Which means that literally, the number of people, those who own the cattle, have more amount of cattle in their household. So along with their houses, the population is less, land is more, cattle is more. So there is no need for them to earn anything, to acquire anything. Because they are already having their own lands, their own properties, their own cattle to provide daily feed for them. Now the problem for the Britishers is that these Britishers could not find anybody who is ready to work at very less wages. This was an unexpected problem for the Britishers because the abundant land and the relatively small population made them to lead a very comfortable life without having any extra income for them. So all these possibilities made them to understand clearly that they have a chance to earn something. But while the chance is being left out for them, there is no other alternative provided for them. So these all things clearly restrained the impact of the Britishers. Yes, these people are capable of occupying the control of the lands, but people are not poor here and not willing to work for a very less amount of wage which is provided by the Britishers. Britishers want them to work for free or for very less wage. When they, there is ev everything available for them without doing any work, why would the people do work for them? So these all conditions created a new problem for them that is no need to work for the Africans. So there is no availability of labor for the Britishers to work in their plantations, to work in their mines. So all these things. So basically Africans are not very rich. But African land is more, people are less, cattle is there for them. So the number of people live in Africa are less when compared to the countries like India and China. So that made the people, the Britishers to think the other possible alternatives to find out the solution. Once they realized all these things, then they decided to go for inheritance law. The existing law has been modified. What is the necessity for them to modify the existing law? As we just now discussed that there are no people available for them to work. And uh, the basic thing is in Africa the population is also very less. So there are two possibilities. Either you need to force a group of people to come and work them or you need to get people from some other country to work here. Getting people from somewhere far away places to Africa is a very difficult task during that time. And the other possible option is motivate the people those who are in Africa or force the people those who are staying there to work for them. So that's how the Britishers decided to modify the existing laws. The inheritance laws. The inheritance law means any family property which is owned by a particular family, if the elder person of the family passes away, then automatically that property passes to the next generation of the people. It depends on the country to country. It varies like it should be given equally to all the uh, male and female members or boys and girls and all. In almost in all the countries now it is observed that it is given equally for boys as well as for the girls. But during this time only the family property which is owned by a particular family can be inherited only by one particular person of the family. That too he, he should be the natural heir of the family. He cannot be an adopted person. So, when if a family is having three members or four members and only one is eligible to get the family properties under his name, the rest of the three 
are now termed as jobless people because of the law which was passed by the Britishers that is the inheritance laws. So this inheritance law made the possibility of the people to find a job which is suitable for them because naturally they are not the owners of their own properties because it is given only for a particular person. It is given only for a particular one person in the family. So the rest of the three members or the four members or five members or the other person who is left out if in case the family has only two people then the rest out people are forced to find a job now. So this was brought by the Britishers. This was the impact of the colonization in Africa. So when this situation came, the people started to think to find some jobs. So as the Britishers need the people to work for them, here the situation is the people need jobs to work. So Britishers need and the requirement of the people in Africa was equated with the law of inheritance laws. So this situation brought the people to the legs of the Britishers and Britishers started to utilize this one in a very effective manner because they knew that if they give freedom for them, many people will not work under them. They will not be showing any interest to work because already they are habituated of owning their own properties. So they forced the people, they forced them to confine to stay only within their compounds in the mining compound or in the estate compounds and they never allowed them to move freely as we have seen in the tea estates happening in Assam during the British India period. So this is how the Britishers earlier they were not able to find any person to work for them but later they modified certain laws which are existing in Britain the sorry which are existing already in Africa the inheritance laws was completely modified in such a way that it brings the people to search for jobs. So this search for jobs made the people to move towards Britishers. Britishers rightly utilized the chance of this one as they were waiting for this opportunity they started to encash this one by making the people to work very hard very long times and not allowing them to go home and spread the tortures or the difficulties which are there in their work day-to-day -day works so that's how the Britishers managed to get this one this is a background picture of the effect of render spread of the cattle plague before the cattle plague spread in Africa, this was a picture. So what happened after the cattle plague has stepped into Africa? What are the changes that it brought in the day-to-day -day lives of the people of Africa? We will check it. So the, with the impact of uh, the render spread of the cattle plague, what happened in Africa? The render spread came to Africa in around the late years of 1880s. Within a very short span, it spread to the, initially it was found in the eastern coast, later on very soon it was found to the western coast and very fast it reached to the Cape of Good Hope covering the entire Africa. Entire Africa was impacted with the cattle plague. Before going into the details, let us find out who brought the cattle plague to Africa. It is none other than the Britishers in order to feed their Italian soldiers who are living in Africa in order to feed them the animal were brought from Britain to Africa in the meanwhile the animal got certain diseases which were not cured the same dead animals and the living animals which are alive were brought to African lands where the living animals were also being impacted with the diseases which were consumed as a diet and also were left out openly in African land which initially started to spread in the eastern parts of Africa like Eritrea and later on it spread like a forest wildfire a very fast growth the disease because as we discussed earlier African lands are very large and also they have more amount of cattle available for them abundant cattle is there so this may be also one of the reason because the disease spread from one animal to another animal also was very high which spread from east to west and from then to the entire deep south 
which covering all the countries where no country is being left out without the impact of the cattle plague the cattle plague made nearly 90% of the cattle of africa to be washed away from there so this situation forced the african people to turn into laborers daily wage laborers this kind of situation also gave chance for the british colonial people as they were also trying to make laws to change the attitude of the africans but the spread of the cattle plague made the work very easy for the britishers the plantation owners the mine owners all these people to force the africans to work under them and the colonial government was really very successful in occupying the other empty lands where people are completely dissatisfied and shocked with the loss of their animal wealth then africans were converted into labor force this is how the people in initially they were not willing to work were forced and willingly joined the struggle of battle of labor because we all know that britishers never used to have even a common attitude of the fellow human beings because they used to feel that these people are born only to work for us in order to increase the glory of the britishers that's how the plan was there and uh, this africans initially they were rich but because of the cattle plague their fates are completely changed now they themselves are ready and willingly joining towards the labor force so the impact of colonization can also be taken the other side of the angle is this because one side of the coin is that the lifestyles have changed the impact have brought certain amount of modernization certain amount of uh, different dressing styles different uh, materials technology has been improved in the countries where the where they were made as colonies by the other countries but here the country which was have prosperous people are self sufficient turned completely into a situation where they were not at all willing to work from that kind of situation they moved on to a place where the situations are completely different and they were forced to work at any cost these kind of all these things were an added situation and finally colonialism can also be understood in a different way this would be a right example for that and after this the labor were having different names branded by this one let us find out about the laboring system in the british rule now let us see the other important side of colonialism as we discussed just now one of the examples which we can be termed as the other side of colonialism the other side of colonialism can also be termed with one more example that is the indentured labor system earlier people used to work to earn something but the situation turned in such a way that people were forced to work because of the rapid globalization we may get it out how can a rapid globalization bring people to less living standard because rapid globalization gives a chance to get more income more possibility of opportunities and options for them but here that is one side of globalization the other side of globalization is this what we are going to study now if you see at this the migration the intended labor is a labor of force who should work for a specific period of time under the same employer then only his return is being promised by the particular employee most of the times the time period was 5 years the person who is bound to work under a particular employee for a certain period of time is called an indentured labor this person is not allowed to work for anybody else there in abroad now most of the people those who migrated are from india and china why what are the reasons for the people to migrate from india to other countries is one is it was ruled by the britishers where indians do not know exactly what's happening outside and the other things are the situations as i told you just now there are two sides for the 19th century or the globalization concept one is faster economic growth more jobs more income more trade more options becoming rich and richer that is one side of the coin while to the other side we have great misery 
poverty great misery and poverty all these things are throwing its impact on the 19th century so in order to understand this clearly we need to have clarity on what are the works that are done by the intended labor people the intended labor people are forced to work in the plantations in the mines for a certain period minimum it was for 5 years if they work only for 5 years only as i told you before intended labor he is a timeline labor he has to work there for certain amount of time then only his return will be guaranteed freely without any conditions so 5 years was the minimum period for them to return back to their homeland and most of the people from india from which regions did they go a study was made on this then they discovered that eastern part of uttar pradesh bihar india's central dry land region tamil nadu central dry land region people were more interested and most often used to go to the people in the category of intended labor so the people from northern part then from the northeastern part then from the central part as well as the southern part tamil nadu their dry lands are there because tamil nadu is always considered as a very fertile region so dry land people of tamil nadu also were forced to go towards intended labor so to which countries did people from india move to abroad as intended labor the countries where they were moving was the caribbean islands which is in the um, middle of north and south africa america where you find it in the panama canal region where is exactly nearby to the equator the caribbean islands where west indies also falls in the category of the caribbean islands so most of the people were forced to send to caribbean islands one more factor what we need to remember here is that the people those were forced to send from india to that particular region is there also we have the britishers ruling that particular countries so that's also one of the reason or most of the britishers went and settled in us so that also could be one of the reason why most of the indians are been sent to far off places especially to the american lands then after caribbean islands mauritius which is very close to us that is very close and in the southern part of asia then fiji islands again in south america and some of the people used to prefer to go for very close locations like from tamil nadu they used to go to ceylon the present name is sri lanka and malaya or malaysia the presently known group of islands so these all clearly reveals for us that people used to work why did people go like this as we discussed earlier one is because of the impact of the 19th century effect the machines got involved the lack of proper work for the people failure of the cultivation system or the agricultural system uh, failure in paying the rents back or returning the money debts they automatically people started to search for labor or jobs this need of the people has been encashed properly by the britishers by bringing in the agents agents are given commission when they recruit any candidate to the abroad so not to get their commission more the agents used to give false informations and fake promises for the people and force the people to agree the contract and forcefully sometimes they used to push them into the ships so that these people can get more commission but the actual conditions when they go there they are all unreal promises and they understand the working conditions and the living conditions are horrible for the people there and sometimes these people used to run away the people those who went to do the work there used to run away looking at the practical situation which is present there so what did the people do if we focus on the new system of slavery as we discussed just now the intended labor system which means the person is forced to work for a certain period of time under a particular employer then only he is being guaranteed to return back to his home country so that system is branded by the historians as the new system of slavery this new system of slavery came to be known to the people only after they reached the new destination after leaving their hometowns obviously if you belong to your hometown and you are working in the hometown you would have 
more authority and confidence to ask any kind of injustice that is being done but once if you move out of your hometown and find place which is far away and that too which is very far away and there is no other possibility to come except with their willing this was also one of the fear which is present among the people those who are traveling as an intended labor so that's how the intended labor has got turned into new system of slavery where people do not have much rights to do this one this is one side but some people after reaching there after understanding the situations there they themselves started to maul themselves and get mixed with the other people and collect the collective opinion and expression so let us see what happened later so the few they were given very few legal rights after they reached their destinations of place of work and they escaped some people really could not bear the torture escaped into the wilds but in return of them when they returned back into the wilds they were being severely punished even knowing that also they could not bear this one so they left out to the far off places but some people who can manage the work they decided to go for collective self expression learning and also getting gathered with other people where the example for this is that in trinad in the uh, caribbean islands region where in south america we have a special uh, muharram festival celebrated as jose jose where all the people of that particular community joined together to do these celebrations it's like a collective it's like a gathering together which happened every year and we also have uh, rasta farikanism the rasta farikanism is most we used in jamaican words so the rasta farikanism has been also popularized by jamaican star he is bob marley who also brought a very good rap or into the people the ideology of collectiveness and we also have in the caribbean islands in the guiana region the chutney music and all these things will reveal for us that is the trinad jose happening in trinad or the rastafarianism by propagated by the jamaican star bob marley and the chutney music in caribbean islands and the guiana reveal for us that there is still the intimacy or intendedness or connection between the indian culture and the caribbean culture because the indians only got migrated there and these people are trying to get adjusted themselves but because of these tortures they try to reestablish their own identity in a far off places the attempts are made very clear but now if you look at some of the names which are in west indies like a nobel peace prize winner v s naipal a writer and west indies cricket players like shivarane chandrapal and ram naresh sarwan all these sounds vaguely like an indian names no they are not vaguely like indian names they are truly indian names because some of these ancestors who went there and settled there as intended laborers these people are the descendants of the intended labor families who settled there so they got the names like this so from 19th century onwards indian nationalists started to oppose the system of intended labor in the homeland of india against the britishers who are the main people the master force behind sending all the people to abroad in the name of intended labor so finally by 1921 the government has banned the system of intended labor but still those who got settled there those who could not return back after the short span of 5 years those people are called as coolies means like a forced labor and this idea has also been shown in some of the books which are written in the early writings of uh, vs naipaul's books where it clearly reveals that they have been feeling that alienation the separation that kind of uh, segregation the apartheid what he has experienced in the initial years even after 1920s also when it was banned so they had the feelings of the separatist group this was a very small minority which continued its existence in the caribbean islands even after the intended labor system has been banned so now let's have a quick recap the situation is that people lost their cultivation they could not do their cultivation properly and lack of rainfall lack of the infrastructure facilities improvement of the irrigational facilities all these things forced the people to become at very 
low level and agree the conditions of the Britishers and work. This in turn got modified into intended labor or the new slavery system where a person is being forced to work for a certain amount of time without any choice whether he is willing to do it or not willing to do it. Once he is entering into the field, he has to work it there for five years which may be in the opposite conditions of his expectations. So finally, some people were able to survive for this one. They started to have their own associations there like the association of Jose in Trinad, then the Rastafarianism of Bob Marley and the Chutney music of Caribbean islands and in Guyana which links us or which can enable us to understand that most of the people in India tried to understand and got mixed up with the globalization. The new term of globalization also got emerged out of this system of people moving from one region to another region where they lost their own identity and try to get connected with the existing country's identity. This adjustability gives us the name or tagline of globalization. And when we talk about the names like VS Naipaul and West Indies cricket players like Shivarani, Chandrapal and Ram Swaran, this shows that some of the descendants of the internet labor people who went there and settled there even after their contracts were been finished up those people families are also still in existence and by 19th century ending I mean like 1900s Indian leaders began to question the system or the actual practice of internet labor finally in 1921 the system was banned but even the system was banned in 1921 for many years the internet labor system continued and even after 1960s also these people were called with the name as coolies meaning that uh, these people have arrived to that country to work under forceful conditions. So this can also be shown in some of the books when we feel the books written by V.S. Naipaul in his early writings we can find this kind of feeling which was expressed by him because he also was one of the victim of this kind of feeling of alienation and loss in the group. So that's how the internet labor has been taking its shape from India to Caribbean islands. Indian entrepreneurs abroad. Till now we have discussed about the Indian intended labor. How did the Indians got migrated from India to the Caribbean islands and then Tamil Nadu from the Tamil Nadu region of southern part of India to the Malay Peninsula as well as to Sri Lanka, Ceylon. Now, how did Indians establish themselves as the entrepreneurs abroad? Let us see the Indian entrepreneurs abroad. First of all, in order to do any market, in order to establish any product, in order to produce any product, the first basic requirement what we need is capital. The capital is the money. What we require in a very large amount to do large scale business. At the same time, if you are a large businessman it would be very easy for the people to get loans from the banks as soon as they approach the banks they easily get the loans but what about the people those who are new to the business those who need money to do businesses in abroad how can they do the trade so these kind of people used to get money from the private money lenders those people famous among them was Shikaripuri Shroffs and the Natukotai Chattiyars. These two family names are very famous because these two are not only the family names but the financial names for the people, those who would like to do trade, especially do cultivation in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, where wherever they required any help for the Indians, they would be ready to finance them. This was a special effect or special importance for the names of these two the Shikarpuri Shroffs and the Natukotai Chattiyars. These two group families have established their own corporate style of carrying money from one place to another place. Even far off places the money has been delivered in a very safe and clear manner where there was no confusion, where there was a high safety requirements and measurements were taken and it was a very successful venture of business in delivering the money to the people those who are staying even thousands of kilometers away from their homelands. That's how the Indians used to get financed 
And the another remarkable entrepreneurs from the Indian backdrop is the Hyderabadi Sindhis. The Hyderabadi Sindhis started to make their own trade by having creos and emporia at every big port where they were being by 1860s became the dominant group to make the best vessels for the people for tourist places. So that's how the Indian entrepreneurs started to establish their own rule or mark in the international market by getting the help from the other groups even though the bankers would not trust the first business people only when you established your own market your own era then the bankers would like to give you loan but these people shroffs and the chatiyars have made some remarkable contribution for the indians who ever would wish to do trade in the central asia south asia southeast asia and also finance the people in a very systematic way just like the corporate offices now we have in the same way they had a very perfect and safe delivery method to carry the cash to from one place to another place so as we discussed about the indian entrepreneurs abroad now we shall move to the other important aspect of indian trade the colonialism and the global system how did the indian market played a very vital role in the british market how is it possible that's the big fundamental question now in order to answer this fundamental question let us try to find out the history that gives the answers for us the fine cotton was initially exported from india to britain this is a known fact but as indian cotton is really a very fine cotton which cannot be matched up with any other cotton which is produced in britain or in africa or in any other country so the local cotton which was made by the britishers was getting a very difficult and tough task from the indian cotton which is being imported into britain so with this the people of britain started to raise their voices like especially the industrious groups or the cotton merchants that in order to safeguard the local interest you need to put extra tariff restrictions or ban the import of indian cotton into britain so with the pressure of the mercantile group and the industrialists the britain government imposed extra tariff taxes on indian cotton with that the indian cotton price has gone up which became double cost almost when compared to the britain's cotton so automatically it resulted in the downfall of the indian cotton import into britain let us look at the statistics according to the statistics when the tariff tax has been increased the indian cloth began to come down in 1815 when in 18th century it was 30% by the time of 1815 it came down up to 15% but by 1870s it completely came down to 3% where it was at very zero level to the trade market but at the same time when the finished products trade has been coming down declining the raw material product from india to abroad also has gained very fast if you look at the statistics for the raw material this we have seen for the finished material now for the raw material in 1812 it was 5% whereas in 1871 it increased up to 35% so when it is the finished product the product is coming down here in the same way here the product went on so the finished product place was replaced by the raw materials and you know to understand it better if you look at the trade relations between india and britain after leaving apart the cotton the other major crop which was exported from india to great britain is indigo the other next major important crop the first major important crop was cotton the second major important crop was indigo so indigo has been exported from britain sorry from india to great britain in a very large scale after it is being exported here i think you all remember that opium opium wars where britishers want to sell opium in china where china people have restricted that one so it was a very difficult task this led to the wars first war and second war where finally 
Britishers were successful, defeated China and got opium into the trade of China. But before that, when China people were restricting the trade of opium, opium was largely produced by the Indians, actually by the Britishers in Indian land and then this has been exported to China and from there the product, whatever money they are getting from that, that is being used to finance the tea and the other businesses in China. So that's how India has been used by the Britishers for a very long time. And not only this, India has been a saving bank for them because the trade which the Britishers are doing with India is a surplus trade. They are in the trade surplus when compared to other countries because Britishers, they have lot of other countries also to share their market. Once the cotton of India has been stopped off with the increase of tariffs, they started to expand their cotton to the other countries to get the global market. So for every product of Great Britain, they started to make it as a global product and selling it to the other countries and making it a very wide market. At the same time, Indian trade, whatever they have is a surplus trade. So they used to use the extra amount of money, whatever they are getting from here to balance the deficit where they are getting loss in any other country where they are doing the business for loss also to balance that one. They used to use the economy of the Indian business, whatever they are getting. And they were also using the home charges, which was actually paid as a extra compensation amount for the British officials who are staying in India the extra amount that has been paid. So that's how the colonial system of the third country will be providing benefits for the mother country in order to compensate the loss between A, Britishers to some other country in Africa, let us put it B. But the actual loss has been compensated by the other country like India C. So A and B are doing business directly. A and C are also doing business. If A and B business is in loss, the A and C business is in positive that would automatically lead to compensate the loss which is present in A and B business sector. So that's how the Britishers used the Indian business and this created the global supply and system for them. So the Indian trade has been connected with the global colonialism. From colonialism, it started to establish the global system. The Indian cotton which was initially being exported from India to Great Britain was forced to have tariff because of the stiff competition what it is getting from the Indian durable cotton. Then because of the lack of this, the cost of the product has been doubled. So automatically the trade has come down. The figures show for us this one. In 18th century it was 30%, in 1815 it came down to 15%, by 1870 it came nearly to 33%, which at the same time the raw material which is being taken from India has increased from 5% to 35% whereas uh, the indigo the next major product which has been imported from India is to get the other benefits because the Britishers always used to keep Indian trade as a surplus trade for them because they have a wide market and they used to make Indians to produce opium and from this they used to sell opium to the China people and from that money they used to finance the tea and the other wooden businesses whatever they have in China and Indian extra income was an additional income to compensate the loss which is being incurred for the Britishers while they were doing any kind of business with the other countries in the other parts of the world. That's how the colonialism helped one country's loss to be recovered by the third country without involving into the first and the second country's business. Now we shall discuss about the third interwar transformation. How did the war economy changed? How did the economy got increased? And later on, how did the economy fell down? So first we shall try to understand what are the factors that gave the rapid growth for the economy under the heading of wartime transformations. Wartime transformations name itself reveals for us that during the war time, there was a huge transformation of the currencies. So as initial stages of the war, there are two groups, allied group, and the Axis group, which were ready to fought the war. So Germany, Austria and Hungary as one group, the Axis group, the allied group, Britain, 
US which joined later and Russia which went off in the middle. So like this two groups joined together and fought the war. In the initial years like when it was started it was started in the month of June and August. So they thought the war would last for maximum for three or four months and then war would be ended by the coming Christmas means December because Christmas is something which is considered as a very holy festival and a very large festival in the western nations but they never expected that it is going to be for nearly four years and the world has witnessed the drastic and the catastrophic war so the first world war gave a chance for the people to find some new jobs which they have never ever thought of the army started to grow in larger and larger size because the armies are to be recruited with a more number of soldiers because of the long time expansion of the war and then we need to buy more number of weapons so which gave a rise for the weapon industries around the countries in the world and then we have a possibility of passing the people from one region to another region transportation facilities have to be increased and then the people in order to attack each other they need to have more and more strength to maintain the stability and more amount of money is being spent on the war weapons so finally the huge investment on the war weapons made the countries to keep more than half of their wealth in that and during this time only the Britishers were able to take more amount of debt from the US citizens as well as from the US government very liberally. So this process of the first world war where the transformation has got changed from a place where there was no bread to the people to a situation where the people were getting handful of works they need more amount of cotton the uniform cloths for the soldiers production of rice in order to feed the soldiers not only in their own country but also in the abroad countries wherever they are fighting the wars and then they also need more amount of weapons they also need more number of soldiers so the demand and the living standard of the people started to grow day by day and the country started to spend more economy to buy the war equipments war weapons and start to invest more in the war items so like this the situation got transformed which increased the investments in millions of rupees this was really a very great change which has occurred during the transformation so in the first stage of understanding the interwar economy the wartime transformation gives us a clear picture that because of the world war one the situations have changed drastically because of the change of the situations drastically the movement went on to a very crucial stage so now whenever they need anything that like soldiers like food or to buy the war equipment they need to invest huge amount so the huge amount because of the war was spent on the roads millions of rupees were laid down waste on the roads because the investment what we do for war is nothing but a unreturned income so it's not a profitable business according to the businessmen people who say that war investments are waste investments somehow many of the historians also come to the same opinion because the money which is spent for fighting war or to recruit the personals for war or to buy weapons during the war time is something where you need not get back anything at any point of time now after the war time transformation happened Britishers came to a situation yes though Britishers were victorious the situation is Britishers are in a huge debt to the US citizens as well as for the US government because the Britain people whenever they need money they used to take it very liberally from the US citizens as well as from the US government also so these all things made US to come down economically and it could not further hold and give a very strong fight to the other countries in the world who are expanding and industrialization started to grow during that point of time the second major aspect after the war what was the situation of the britain as i told you just now britishers started to take money liberally from the us citizens 
as well as from the US government that made US to come down drastically in economically though Britain was victorious in the war but the situation turned very drastically and could not find the possible alternative of getting the fruits of the victory because they have spent huge money at various corners of the world which is not going to be returned back but the debts remained clearly in the name of the Great Britain. So finally the situation is that Britishers though they were victorious they were part of the victory team they were able to defeat Germany and Austrian team but literally they are in the severe economic debts to the US people and after the war when the war boom contrast came less contracted when it was reaching to its lower levels because once war has been stopped there is no need to produce any war weapons further and no country will be willing to buy those things so this made the country to still come down further because most of the people those who are working in any of the industries related to war has come down so this also increased in 1921 out of every five persons one person lost the job one person was thrown out of the job because there was a war boom contrast so this also affected the economy of the Great Britain but during this time only the Japanese people industries started to grow further and some of the industries have come up in China also so with the growth of economy in Japan in China and in some of the parts of India Indian national movement also came to be a very strong agitation movement so these all also gave impact on the growth of Great Britain while Great Britain is severely suffering from this economic debts of the US people and also scarcity of the jobs unemployment situation where people are completely dissatisfied with the existing systems so now these all added for the post war period for the Great Britain yes initially they were very happy when the war was happening economy was supported for them they got huge fronts funds from their friends from the US and the government of the US also but as the time passed on when they need to repay back literally Great Britain started to fall down and most of the wealth what it has taken as a loan has been invested in the war economy where they were not able to get any kind of extra benefits from that so finally lot of money means millions of money was invested on the roads where they were not getting any kind of returns back for that but the debts have to be cleared finally to the US people and at the same time when US is giving loans like this the other in the east Japan started to raise up very fast industrialization started rapidly there their growth reached to very high level their economy became stable their soldier strength increased and they became very fast rising country in the east then in India then in China so all these movements also added for the conditions to become crucial and difficult for the Great Britain people as well as Great Britain to manage the colonial powers as well as the home situations then when we move on to the rise of mass production when the mass production has to be raised the concept of mass production was first initially involved in US it was the company called Ford which has brought the mass production aspect to a very peak of its extent how did these people get the idea of doing mass production what is the necessity of doing mass production the problem is here as the economy has come down not only in Britain but also in US because of the war the impact has also been felt in US but the fastest recovered country was United States because when these people started to realize that we are not able to get any money back they started to invest their monies in the other industries rather than in the war industries now the money which has been lended were been asked back so they were started to get back their money and this made the force situations difficult for UK people but it is a positive trend for the US people so US people started to do investments slow rapid industrialization was started this industrialization process was very slow and not very impressive during that time but looking at the conveyor belt method of bringing the newspaper down or doing the milk packets packing all these things observed by Ford company in charge he realized that with the mass production we can make the same work done by the conveyor belt 
the conveyor belt will repeat the same work which has to be done by it so automatically the production will increase because the mass production will bring more further benefits for them and also during that time he also made it very clear that in front of every conveyor belt we should have a manual lever standing so when a manual lever is standing in front of a conveyor belt and making it to work he does not dare to leave this one and go and chit chat with his friends or even if he takes a break also he will take it for a very short time this is how the initial idea of mass production was started he started the industry and in that production he increased the production with this he made the industrial workers to work for a very long time and started to earn more and more profits with this more number of the industrial workers started and decided to resign to their jobs because they were not able to cope up with the necessity of the work and it becomes very difficult for them to inculcate them with the technology which is very new for them but during that time ford for the first time has doubled the daily wage for them and this doubling of the wage attracted the employees again back and then company started to gain three times four times further this added for this and it proved very successful for the efforts made by the ford management and he dared enough to say that the best way of cutting down the tax or cutting down of his income or expenditures was to increase the wages of the employees generally we feel increasing the wage of the employees is a burden for the company but for the first time in the history where the production has been increased and also the cost of income was also very high for the company that's how he made a statement that the best way to cut down the expenditure is to increase the wages of the employees this made a great change in the mass production this mass production started to spread not only in us from us it started to spread to various corners of us from then it started to move to the other countries of europe so as the situation started to turn towards the positive side so from 1921 22 the industrial production started to reach to its peak and further it started to going on further but during that time only there is something that happened to bring the entire countries to trouble when initially the loan which was given by the us citizens they decided to take back their loan amounts the britishers the other countries whoever has taken the loan they are forced to pay back the loans but when they were forced to pay back the loans where they are not having money the economy has been started to tremble for that particular countries and it's not only that the impact was not only on the countries who took loan from us it is also on the countries like us also so that is nothing but the great economic depression took place in the year 1929 so the great economic depression why do we call this one as a great economic depression is the impact of the great economic depression was felt in each and every corner of the world as we discussed till now the mass production concept has given a boom for the us economy and the recovery of us economy has also added a boom for the european economy to recover but finally in 1929 when the economic depression hit the world the first major thing what us did was the us people started to ask back their loans initially it was very free for the countries to get loan from us and it is around 1927 28 period the amount of money given as loan was more than 1 billion but in the very next year it came down to just 1/4 of the amount so it shows all the countries which are associated with the trade and with the investments of the us were drastically coming down and in order to support their own country's stability they started to increase the export duties and all and import duty charges this also made the other countries the situation more worst and along with this they also we started to ask them to repay back the loans and in competition with the dollar the british pound sterling also started to fall down literally and not only this all the countries whichever country is associated with the financial assistance of the us was trying to face a lot of difficulties because of the situation so these all these things added and improved the situation more difficulties 
for the people during that period the economic depression has reduced the employment opportunities and the banks started to ask to repay away all the loans in order to save the situation from great economic depression so the impact was not only really felt in europe as the money was been removed from the us hands the money started to get back to the us countries but not literally in us also in us also many companies were been shut down many banks are being closed so when we talk about the impact of us especially because of the great economic depression us was also not left out us also got its impact us also was facing lot of problems nearly 4000 banks in us were declared as bankrupts they could not return the money back to the investors so 4000 banks were shut down and nearly 1 lakh 10000 companies were closed because of unable to pay back the loans and unable to pay the salaries to the employees so this was a situation around some 1933 1934 but by 1935 the situations turned little bit positive sign and the economy started to improve in a good sign where the countries again started to focus on the development and the industrial growth now let us discuss what is the impact of great economic depression on the indian land the impact on india because of the great economic depression was also not left unturned india was actually in the control of the britishers where when britishers are facing troubles automatically the impact fell on the indians as we discussed in the previous segment that indian economy or indian business or indian profits are used to compensate the loss which they are getting incurred because of the flap businesses what they are doing in the abroad countries but when uk was in severe trouble and lost many of its colonies and could not control the colonies very effectively during that time the loss started to come in india also the prices for the agricultural lands for the agricultural outputs has started to come down the imports and exports have fallen down drastically and even though the revenue has been reduced from the sources of imports and exports and everything the british government did not reduce any kind of revenue taxes which are been levied on the people this made the situations more and more worst for the indian farmers and the jute bags business which was initially considered as a very profitable business also has come down with the ban on the jute bags and earlier people used to buy jute bags with a double cost and it used to be exported to the other countries 60% of the world's jute bags are been exported from indian land only but when the jute bag trade came down people farmers those who brought the jute bags to sell they have to sell it for very less cost after doing a lot of hard work in the field getting it into the crop and getting the crop into their hand and afterwards taking it to the market after the harvest is done the broker or the person money lender the person whoever is buying the merchant used to pay 5 rupees or 10 rupees a very less cost for the product output this has literally brought down the entire economy of india and not only this during this period only mahatma gandhi has launched the civil disobedience movement the civil disobedience movement also was at its peak in 1931 32 during this period the situations also turned worst so because of the civil disobedience movement also many of the people the cost of all the products have come down the business failed many of them lost their jobs many of them could not find a possible alternative of working in the agriculture or to find out any other industrial work because industries are also out of the work agriculture has completely failed due to lack of rains so all these factors started to impact the day to day life of the people of the indians but as the situations let us look at the other side of the coin there are some particular people who are not very happy but happy for the changing situation those people are the middle class group people as the cost of all the commodities has come down and their salaries are at the fixed scale during the british india period so 
that made them to feel very happy because everything is coming under their affordable cost this has somehow added happiness to some particular categories of people especially the middle class people so now in this unit we have discussed about the war time transformation the post war recovery and then the rise of the mass production afterwards we discussed about the great economic depression and the role or the impact on india because of the great economic depression in this we have covered all the aspects let us look at the key points in this one in the war time transformation initially the britishers are rich they were able to manage many countries under their control but in the initial years when the first world war was started they thought many countries thought that this war would end by the coming christmas or month of december but the situation changed drastically and it went on for another 4 years and during this time only the income which is held by the britain started to be invested in the war equipment so that made the money of the britishers to get struck in the war fields and where you don't get the income return back and this made the situations like to get money lended by the us government and the us citizens so later on british resulted in falling in debt with the british sorry the us people and the us citizens next the post war recovery after the war happened many countries have spent their huge amounts in the war equipments and will not get any money returned back but the debts which were taken on the name of war remained and continued still further so this situation made britain to lose its autonomy till that time its monopoly on the countries especially the colonial countries in the africa and in east asia because the rising power of japan started to attack them back with the growth in the industries and rapid growth in economy and also the mass production concept came during this period in the 1920s later part where one of the company owners has understood the mechanism and realized and gave a systematic plan to implement it and where he was very successful the production has come double triple and increased the income for the company when the workers decided to move out because of the heavy pressure on them then he doubled the income of the wages of the people those are working under him and he further also mentioned very clearly that this is the best way to cut the expenditure actually many of the people feel that increasing the salaries for the employees is a burden for the company but he improved the income of the company so much that he further told openly that the best way to cut down the expenditure is to increase the salaries of the employees by doubling it that was a historical speech when he made in the extra income when his company has been successfully in a very large scale from 9 million production it increased to 12 million and later on it started growing on so this good discovery on recovery of economy in us started to show its impact not only in us but also in other parts of europe and later we have the effect of great economic depression the great economic depression was severely hit by many countries in the world the major hit was great britain where the impact fell very severely every one out of the five have lost their jobs and many of the people those have given loan for the great britain as started to ask it to pay back by the us citizens and the us government so the impact was also felt on the us also us 4000 banks have closed and declared as bankrupt because they could not repay back the loan for their customers and nearly 1 lakh 10000 companies were shut down because of the lack of proper money to provide the salaries for them and all these things show us how severe the economic depression is the economic depression of 1929 was economically politically socially economically all aspects made and left the people unending to find out what is the solution for this one and later what is the impact of great economic depression on india indian trade indian agriculture was completely coming down drastically and it has come down to more than less than half of its earlier imports or exports and with this the production the cost everything has increased but there is no output the 
jute trade has completely come down and the cost of jute has completely drastically came down and these all situations forced the indians to search for the other possible alternatives and during this time also britishers did not reduce any of their revenue taxes so all these things added to the situation but one section of people in india are happy even though gandhi ji started the civil disobedience movement during the economic depression time only the middle class income group people whose incomes are fixed and whose impact on the products has started to come down so they were feeling very happy because they are able to get all the products at their affordable cost and sometimes the farmers also used to try to maintain equality by getting extra product output of the crop to balance and get more money but still many a times it never did any benefit for the indian farmers and indians started to invest more on the gold items where it gave a speed recovery for great britain as rightly mentioned by j m kennis that the best aspect of the indians supported the britishers to recover is investing in the gold but this supported the british to recover very soon but not for the indians or indian farmers it resulted in a very little growth for the indian farmers or the indian businessmen people where they could not find any much growth by investing in the gold but this investment on the gold added for the britishers to get more profits so that is the main understanding of the third part of the schedule that is the interwar economy now the rebuilding the rebuilding a world economy after the war the post war era is another important aspect which we need to cover it completely and clearly because we have seen the world war 1 then we have seen the impact of world war 1 and how did the country started to gain back from world war 1 and then how did they move further and what happened next so after the country started to recover slowly after the great economic depression within a very short span of 20 years the world has witnessed the second world war the second world war has played a very major role in the lives of the people and not only the people in every corner of the world the impact has been felt and this is the dangerous man made catastrophe which has been experienced by the 20th century people nearly 60 million people died because of the second world war and many of them are soldiers and the working men and in the first world war if you look closely and study closely it led to the emergence of usa as a dominant power after the world war 1 when we discussed about the post recovery period of world war 1 us is lending money to uk where prior to this uk was filthy rich it's having excess trade surplus trade but the situation changed after world war 1 but after world war 2 us dominance also came down a bit and ussr dominance started to increase usa and ussr together fought against the germans nazi germany people also improved very well their economy in the past 10 years before the world war 2 they also gave a very tough fight only with the entry of ussr the game has been changed completely ussr initially it was a very undeveloped backward agricultural country but as the time passed on as years changed on when the capitalist world like usa headed countries were struggling with economic depression the country which has seen the capital stability fully economic stable and strong army and gave a very good lesson to the world through the new concept of communist policy so it also gave a chance for the russia to emerge as a superpower nation in the world after the second world war and then along with this it also maintained a stable income for the countries why we need to have a stable income after the second world war many of the experts who studied the detailed procedure reasons and pros and cons of the world war 2 they were able to understand that some things are compulsory to have a global market a full income full employment then only we would not fall into the economic depression otherwise we will definitely fall into the economic depression so then the two major lessons what we learned is 
first one from the second world war is stable economy should be maintained and then full employment how can you maintain a stable economy in a country we can maintain a stable economy in a country only with the involvement of that particular country's government in the capital and the flow of the goods this is another important understanding of second world war so then they realize that government's role is crucial not only in income but also in providing employment opportunities to all of its citizens and like this understanding the un monetary financial committee conference was held at new hampshire in usa in july 1944 in order to understand discuss and to have a stable economy with this it was also known as bretton woods meet where after the conference they decided to establish the international monetary fund and also to develop the countries which are getting newly independence or which are struggling from the colonial problems the international bank for reconstruction and development most of the times it is called as world bank so these imf and ibrd are popularly known as bretton woods twin brothers or twin sisters so this started to work from 1947 and usa started to be the game changer from second world war period though ussr has been a stable economic country the influence of us was more in establishing the imf and the ibrd so they made it very clear that dollar would be the determining currency to determine what is the cost of the gold and with that they decided to have 1 dollar is equal to 1 ounce of gold and this has been the standard currency of that time but due to the changes of the situations of the second world war as britain became completely weak and it could not further hold any of its colonies for a long time they decided to give freedom for some of the countries so decolonization started new countries started to become independent or colonized countries started to become independent this gave further a boom for the countries to discuss the other possible alternatives now once the countries are becoming independent the newly emerging countries are having a very difficult and tough task in front of them that is how to fill or how to eliminate poverty from their own countries who are been facing the colonial dominance from hundreds of years so this started to question the ability of us dollars determination till that time us was a very stable economy but because of the bankruptcy in us or because of the turbulences of the finances and the growing of the eastern economies like china japan and all these countries the focus of the imf also shifted from european countries and the western countries towards the eastern europe asian and the african countries so that initiated the process of having a new group of countries that is g7 countries or establishing or asking for a demand to have a new international economic order that is nieu so this is how the post second world war the rebuilding of the world happened and this not only initiated the process for the development of the countries in this the dollar mark also lost its prominence and because of the international fluctuations in the economy that resulted in the growth of the situations which further raised that dollar could not be further a standard currency and dollar also started to come down its value when competence with the gold that's how the new international economic order has been placed and many of the colonial master countries even though for name sake they have given freedom for the colonial group countries but for the most of the times they only used to control all the natural resources of the countries and keep under their name even us used to control many of the other countries oil reserves for a very longer period of time that's how the new dimensions and new outlook of the countries started to come out after the second world war and the efforts are been made to improve the standard of living of the people from all sides and every issue started to be debated discussed and then the further action has been taken that's what we have learned in this unit and especially in the fourth part of the scheduled part of the lesson that is the second world war the impact of the second world war and the emergence of the ussr the stable income is the most important understanding of the second world war and the full employment 
also should be taken by the responsibility of the government. This two ideologies gave to have a international summit that is United Nations Monetary Financial Conference was held and they was headed by USA, held in USA only in the New Hampshire and then Bretton Woods twins or brothers were introduced that is IMF and the IBRD in 1947 they started to work and the standard currency has been determined as dollar and that is for one ounce of gold but the situations changed drastically dollar also started to be questioned why is a dollar a standard currency because there are fluctuations in the dollar currency also and the economic situations also the newly decolonized countries started to become independents and they also started to have a new group that is the group 7 especially requesting and asking in a loud manner to have a new international economic policy which will bar off all the colonial master countries to hold the natural resources which are not providing the any benefits for the own country which owns the reserves like this the country started to rebuild their structure after the second world war as the country started to ask for the change of the twin brother system of this Breton Woods then the system has got completely changed and the multinational companies started to shift their production units towards the low wage income country groups in Asia and Africa which also gave a boom to have MNCs into the Asian corners and towards the African countries where TVs, cell phones all these started to come at very less cost and the economy of Japan, India and China started to get transformed from a low income group countries to a middle and average income group countries so that's how the second world war and after the world war period the country started to grow their economy by building their economic status internally and also globally.